So uh, about a week ago, I was uh, on the top of Pikes Peak sliding down a snowbank. Unbelievable. The beauty of uh, Colorado, we got to go there on vacation, is amazing. Never been there before. It was just incredible. And uh, as we continue our series about Jesus and you, Jesus was called the creator. And so uh, let's check this out. The topic is Jesus in creation. Now, we don't often think about Jesus um, in that way. Usually we think of Jesus kind of, well, he's over in the New Testament and creation happened in the Old Testament. So what does Jesus have to do with creation? And actually the answer can be surprising uh, for us. Uh, there's actually a, a clue, uh, a hint in Genesis chapter one itself when God uh, is creating things and he says, let us uh, you know, make uh, the light and the darkness and uh, the day and the night, the moon, the stars. Uh, he concludes his creation by saying, let us make man in our own image. And so why is it plural? It, it's clearly in the Hebrew plural. And the answer is that God is one in three that uh, God, the God who is the only God is actually three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so when we come to the book of John in the New Testament, he actually talks about an in the beginning as well. Um, and this in the beginning actually predates uh, the creation uh, chapter. And John 1.1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning and nothing was made that was made without Him. And so who is the Word? That's the question. And we find the answer to that in verse 14 a little further down because it tells us the Word became flesh and He made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory uh, as of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So it's very clear in this passage that the Word who was with God and was God was Jesus, God the Son. So we had God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all together, all part of that creation. And uh, Jesus, who uh, is God the Son in the flesh, uh, we see that in John, well, that was his role, his role um, was uh, to be there and as the Father spoke things into creation, Jesus actually executed the Father's will. That's what Jesus does throughout the Bible. He executes the Father's will. And so Jesus had that role in creation. And there's other passages in the New Testament that tell us that he actually holds all things together. So without Jesus actively holding our world together, it would fall apart. So Jesus and you, and Jesus is our creator. And uh, this past uh, 10 days or so, we got to see the beauty of that creation. I'd never been uh, to the mountains, and uh, by 2 o'clock, about 2 p.m. every day, my beauty meter was full. I'm like, I just cannot see any more beautiful things. The mountains and the valleys, it was just incredible. And I got to spend the time with uh, my best friend from college. His name's Keith, and uh, he is a hiker and a runner. And uh, he said, hey, you want to go hiking? And so I didn't want to seem like the, a wimp. So I said, yeah, let's go hiking. And uh, so we drive to the parking lot. We get out of the parking lot. And, and we were not very far up. We were going up 1,000 feet. And then we're going to go on in. And uh, we were not very far up that 1,000 feet. And my arm starts aching. And, and the circulation's down. And I'm <sighs> the air was so thin. And... Uh, it was tough. I needed power. I need energy. I needed not just motivation. I had motivation. I had dedication. I had all that. I needed power, the ability to be able to keep going, keep moving. And fortunately, my friend Keith, was, he's a kind guy. He said, hey, we can stop whenever you need to. And, and we did many, many times. Uh, but we needed power. In your life, where do you find yourself needing power? Where do you find yourself, not just motivation, not just dedication, the actual power to do it, to move, to keep 
going. You may be in a broken relationship and you, you may need power to be able to say, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? You, you may need power to go, hey, I forgive you. Or I, I want to offer you forgiveness. You may be addicted to something and you need power to confess, go public with it, turn away from it, live day by day away from it. You may be lonely. You may have said yes to a ministry. You may have said yes to making a difference in people's lives, to serving people and loving them. And it's hard. And you, you really enjoyed it at first. It was fun. And now it's not fun. And you need the power to continue and keep going. It wasn't so many years ago that you said, I love you to her. And it was awesome. It was just so easy. It just felt so good. And now you need power to keep that promise, to keep loving. Parenting takes enormous power. It takes enormous power to get up every day and be able to go, no, I'm going to do what's best for them, not what feels good. It may be in your career. It may be at work. It may be in loving people in your neighborhood or loving people at work. You need power. So then we're talking about Jesus and you. Where did Jesus get his power from? Did you ever ask yourself that question? Where did he get his power from? And you said, well, we just found out that he's a creator. I mean, he has that kind of power. He is all powerful. Well, it might surprise you to find out, and this is what this is all about today. It might surprise you to find out that is not where he got his power from. Jesus, who had the power to create, who did create, it says in Philippians that he emptied himself. That his reputation to be God or to be seen as God, he emptied himself of that. And he became a man, a servant. He, he became human. He said, I'm not going to live from my own power, my own dedication, my own will. Instead, he said, I'm going to live by the power of the Spirit. So we're going to take out, take here, jump into a few passages here. And the whole goal is to show you that Jesus did not live by his own power. He didn't live by the power he had to create. He didn't live by his all-powerfulness. He lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. First of all, he was filled by the Holy Spirit. As soon as Jesus was baptized, by the way, he was 30 years old when he was baptized. Do you ever think about the fact that the first 30 years, no one really knew who he was? Yes, we have the Christian story because it was written down, but they didn't celebrate Christmas back then. Nobody knew who he was. He was just a normal carpenter or carpenter's son. He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him. At that moment, he was, he was filled with the Spirit of God. He was led by the Spirit of God. Just shortly after that, it says, or not shortly, in Mark it says, at once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. This is when he gets tempted. This is when he goes face to face with Satan. First, he doesn't eat for 40 days. He fasts for 40 days. And so he's incredibly hungry. And now he has to face temptation. It's real temptation. He's human. He feels hunger, just like you. He feels loneliness, just like you. And each of these temptations, Satan would come to him, and, and he uses the three that he uses on us. One, feeling of possessions and of known, that I'm known by somebody. And each one of them, he does not answer. No, 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 I would never do that. Oh, that's not who I am. He answers from the Word of God. He takes the Spirit of God together with the Word of God. That's where he answers from. He also ministered in the Spirit. So as soon as he leaves the wilderness, this is what happens. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And the news about him spread through the whole countryside. 
So now he's beginning to teach, he's beginning to travel, he's beginning to minister, and he's doing it how? In the power of the Spirit. He goes into a temple, and he's teaching, and he says this, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is ministry. How? Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because I've been anointed by the Spirit of the Lord. He is not ministering from his own strength, his own determination. He is ministering from the power of the Spirit. Next, he performed miracles by the power of the Spirit. In Acts, it says, How anointed Jesus of Nazareth, how anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. I'm sorry, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth and the Holy Spirit with power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. Because God was with him. Even his miracles. He's all powerful. Yes, that's not what he depended upon to do these miracles. It was done from the power of the Spirit. I don't know if you know this, but the Bible says in, in Romans, it says that he actually rose from the dead by the power of the Spirit. The same Spirit that lives in every believer. It even says that. It says the same power that rose Jesus, raised Jesus from the dead is, this, is the power that lives in you. So how did he do that? How did he do that? Can you imagine being hungry and going, you know what? Instead of me making my own bread, I'm going to depend on God to provide for me. Instead of me taking care of all of these needy people for my own power, even though I can, I do have that power, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to depend upon God for that power. Let me ask you this. If you had the power to provide for yourself what you needed, Would you ever talk to God about it? You can answer that question. There's a lot of things you do have the power to provide. Do you ever talk to God about it? Does it irritate you to have to depend upon God? Does it irritate you to be put in a position where where God has to come through or you're in trouble? For Jesus, he actually had the power and said, no, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to depend upon my Father. And therefore, the Spirit worked in his life. How did did this work? How did this happen? How did the power work in in, in Jesus' life? It worked like this. Jesus said, this is not about me. In Philippians, when he said, I emptied myself, he's like, this is not about me. He said, this is not about my identity. You know, people know who I am. It's not about my opinions. It's not about my needs. It's not about my family, and it's not about my career. It's about the Father. I have come, and I've been sent by the Father. Somebody, uh, last day or two, somebody sent us a text and it was a young mom. And she said, I've been, le- I've been reading a lot of blogs. I've been interacting with a lot of blogs because I want to improve as a mom. I want to do a great job as a mom. But I keep seeing these themes come back again and again and again. It's this, that what you need to do for your child is you want to make sure they're comfortable, that they're seen, and they're heard. You know what Jesus did? Jesus came and said, I'm uncomfortable. I'm going to live a life uncomfortable. He even said, listen, people said, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. You sure you want to follow me? Because I don't have a pillow. I don't have any place to lay my head. To be seen and to be heard. Jesus continually would minister to people and then go. 
He just leave. He could have had huge more crowds than he did, but he kept leaving. He kept leaving. He wanted the Father to be seen, and he wanted the Father to be heard, but it wasn't about him. Ultimately, what he did with his life was he said, I'm going to trust God the Father, not myself. And when he did that, the power of the Spirit ruled in his life. So, how did he do it practically, right? How did he, what, what were some of the things he did to live or to depend upon the power of the Spirit? Well, number one, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. Humbled himself doesn't mean he went around going, oh, I'm, I'm terrible, I'm terrible, I stink. No, humbled himself means he didn't think about himself. He thought about the Father. It says... Well, what he did is he got up early and he prayed. He got up early and he prayed. That has always puzzled me. You're God. Like, why do you need to pray? Right? You are God. Mike, just explain that to us. Why do you need to spend time praying? Here he is. He, he is in a world where there is leprosy. There are people who are starving. There are people who are all kinds of diseases. There's, there's a lot of demon possession happening. And they live in an area where the Romans have a ter- tyrannical oppression of the Jews. His people. Why does he wake up early in the morning and go get something done? But he doesn't. He keeps praying. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. What did he pray? We don't know exactly. Actually, his prayers during that time, they're not recorded. He did when people said, hey, how should we pray? He said this, you should pray, and it's the Lord's Prayer, first Hallowed be your name. This, God, I want your name lifted up. I want your name honored. This is about you, God the Father. This is what this is about. I'm here for you. He humbled himself. Your kingdom come. That's the big one. It wasn't about Jesus' kingdom. It was about the Father's kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. So he's not praying, God, build my kingdom. Make people see me. He's going, God, make them see you. Goes on to say, provide for us. Again, think about this. He's the creator, and he chooses to put himself in a position where God would provide for him. He did it again and again and again and again. Forgive us as we forgive. Lead us away from temptation. Deliver us from temptation. God, you're the one I'm going to depend on. I need you to come through. Another place it says, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. What did, what did the Father call Jesus to? He called him to the exact same thing he calls you to, that Jesus calls you to. He called him to rest to rest in the Father, to know that the Father's going to take care of him. He called him to follow, to obey. And he called him to God's mission, the Father's mission of reaching us, reaching the world. The second thing that he did was he obeyed his Father. I love, I love, I love this passage. Whenever I'm frustrated with life, I, I love to come back to this passage. I think this passage makes life so simple. He's, this happens when Jesus is interacting with his disciples, and they've run out of food, and uh, they're, they're, they're going to go get food, and the disciple says, what about you? What about you? And he says this, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Have you ever done that? Have you ever gotten so involved in a project you forgot to eat? Like, this is, I'm working on this. This is so great. Hey, man, have you eaten? What time is it? 
No, nah, this is better than food. Now, we cannot do that multiple days, and neither did Jesus. Okay? He did eat. But the, the work of the kingdom, the work of his Father, is way more important than food. That's, that's what he lived on. That's what nourished him, was obeying his Father. Then he says in another passage, he's interacting and, and they're, they're talking about his authority. And he says, for I did not speak on my own. I did not speak on my own. Whew. That would keep us out of so much trouble. If you just stop speaking on your own. Well, I, I thought I needed to say something. Or you need to hear my opinion. Or I just had to get it off my chest. Nope. I did not speak on my own, but the command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Right down to the words. Like, hey, I am here to speak for the Father. It's not about me. It's not about my identity. It's not about my pride. It's not about my ego. I am here to speak what the Father asked me to speak. And when he did that, the power of the Spirit ruled his life, empowered his life. What did he think about the Father? Why, would he, why was he so detailed that every single word, every word, he said, I'm, I'm not saying anything if it's not for my Father. It was, it was in this line. He said this, but the command leads to eternal life. Because I can trust my Father. I can trust my Father. If I put my, hand, my life in His hands, if I obey the Father, it leads to eternal life. That doesn't mean, oh, that means I get to go to heaven. No, it means it's life. It's what life is all about. We do this all the time. We think that we need to have or to say or to, okay, yeah, I understand God. I understand. I understand what you said. I understand what your commands said. But to really live, I got to do this too. Jesus believed, no, 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 there's no life in that. There's only in life in obeying God's word. So what does that mean for you? Well, when it comes to Jesus and you, the most amazing thing he did I really do believe this. I, 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 I know the most powerful and life-changing thing he did was die on the cross and raise from the dead. But the most mind-boggling thing to me is he became a human to the point that he relied on the Spirit the exact same way he calls on us to rely on the Spirit. He showed us how to do it. He's not calling us to do something he didn't do. And he's not calling on us to become superhumans. He's calling on us to say, wait a minute, this life is not about me. It's not about my identity. It's not about my opinions. It's not about my needs. It's not about my family. And it's not about my career. It's not about me. What does this come down to for us? This is about Jesus. The way the Holy Spirit's power works in your life is super simple. It's not complicated. When you believe Jesus, the power of the Spirit works in your life. You, at any moment in time, you believe Jesus for any specific thing, the power of the Spirit works in your life. I, I experience this on a daily basis with loving my wife. On a daily basis, I have a choice. Love her the way God wants me to love her, or love her the way I want to love her. And I have a particular amount of power to do that. I do not have the power to love her the way that God wants me to love her. And I have a choice right at that moment to be able to go, Jesus, I believe you. I love Lori more than I love me. I believe you. That if I love Lori the way you've called me to love Lori, it will bring life. Well, there's another voice in my head going, don't do that, don't do that. No, no, do it on your own. No, 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 don't, no, don't do that. You'll lose control. Don't do that, you're going to lose. But when I believe Jesus, wow, 
the power of the Spirit goes to work in my life, in my heart. That exact same thing is true for all of us. When we believe Jesus for what he says, when we oh, humble ourselves, connect to him, obey him, the power of the Spirit, from, by faith, because we believe in Jesus, by faith, the power of the Spirit works in our lives. You see, many, many times when we pray and we interact with God and we're looking for power, we want God's power to make us comfortable. That's what we want. This past week, I, I rented a... It was crazy. This was a crazy thing, right? The cheapest vehicle you could rent in Colorado was a decked-out Suburban. Like, it was, it was supposed to be an Explorer, but it turned out to be an Expedition. turned out to be a Suburban, right? It had 39 miles on it when I got it. It was brand new. It was comfortable. It was really comfortable. Do you know how many times I've asked Jesus to work in my life so I can be comfortable? You know what comfortable to me is? I don't need Jesus. I don't need the power. I got it. I got all the money I need. I got all the food I need. I'm happy. I got the house I need. I got the ministry I need. When you pray for that, there is no power of the Spirit. Why? Jesus calls us to sacrifice and follow him. He, God called him to follow him. And that means you're going to be in lots of places where you need the power of the Spirit. Not comfortable. How, to, how about to be seen? I need to be seen. Lori, I need you to see me, understand me, know me. Which basically means do what I want. Right? Jesus says, no, you don't need to be seen. You make sure I'm seen. You humble yourself, obey me. I need to be heard. I need to be heard. Oh, please listen to me. No. You don't need to be heard. What you need is the power of the Spirit. And so Jesus calls us to humble ourselves, believe him, trust him. And when we do, we may not be comfortable, we may not be seen, we may not be heard, but we will experience the power of the Spirit. Five quick things. Uh, one, stop trying to prove yourself. What's God call us to? Rest, to follow him. Jesus calls us to rest, to follow him, and to his mission. Stop trying to prove yourself. Rest in who he is. I want to be somebody. I want to be known for somebody. I want to succeed. Stop, stop, stop. Rest in his forgiveness. Rest in his identity. Rest in what he is going to make you and operate from that place. You watch, you do that, you'll see the power of the Spirit work in your life. Stop listening to yourself and saying, God told me. Uh, I, I sometimes get on themes. I think this is a theme I'm on. It is heartbreaking to watch people say, God told me, and then they go, they, what they think God told them is the exact opposite of what the Bible said. Don't, don't do that. You know why that happens? Because you're operating from your own power. You got your own mission. You got your own thing going on. You've been hurt. Let me back up just, no, I guess we can do that at the end. Instead of God telling you, surrender. Surrender to what the Bible says. Surrender to what other people tell you when you say, hey, I'm dealing with this issue. Hey, this is what the Bible says. Surrender to what Jesus says. Pray together with Jesus. Surrender. 
Did you know that Jesus is your advocate? What we learned today is that Jesus prayed. And so sometimes you feel like Jesus is way far away. You feel like he's, he's just so far away and you're trying to pray and you're trying to pray and we'll come out. No, 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 no. Surrender to him and realize he's your advocate. You pray with him. He's praying for you. He's right there with you. Pray with him. Number four, obey together with Jesus. Jesus said, God, I'm here for your mission. What we say is, Jesus, we're here for your mission. Did you know there's 49,967 people that live in Bloomfield? That's our mission. That's our mission. That's what we're here for. Say yes to that mission with Jesus. It's Jesus in you. Just like he did. Listen, I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. And lastly, rejoice together with Jesus. Jesus, he's known for joy. He says it over and over and over again. Hey, I I wish you had my joy. I want to share my joy with you. I want you to experience my joy. The reason why I'm here is I want you to experience joy. Experience it with him. It's Jesus and you. Surrender to him. Surrender to his rest. Surrender to his way of life. Surrender to his mission. Now, for many of you, you remember. You remember. You remember that day you became a believer and you believed Jesus. You remember the joy. You remember what it felt like to be forgiven. You remember. This is awesome. And you're like, I want to live here forever. This is, this, is, this is great. And a number of you said, you know what? I am no longer doing that anymore. I know that, I know that Jesus, this, that's, not, that's not life. This is life. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to go where he goes. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that the rest of my life. The power of the Spirit. Was it working in your life? But then, two, three weeks later, you came home, and your wife just berated you for no reason. And she, she was mean. And something happened. Or maybe you got involved in a ministry, and you got hurt. You got betrayed. Something happened. Or you lost a dream, or you lost a job. And you thought, and you prayed, and you thought God was going to come through here, and it didn't happen. Or there was a loved one that you prayed for, and you, you thought for sure they would be healed, but they weren't. And something happened. At that moment, you said, okay, Jesus, I'm not going to believe you anymore. I'm going to have to do this from my own strength. I'm going to have to do this from my own power. I'm going to have to deal with this from my own power. And it's no longer Jesus in you. It's Jesus in you. My friend Keith, the guy that I got to stay with, had one of the most unusual jobs in the world. He worked for a company called uh, Gordon Foods. Gordon Foods is a big food distributor in the Midwest. Um, they're very, very successful. And they have, a, they have built a trust. And, and what they do from this trust is they want to give away money to missionaries or any kind of ministries they can that will help people come to Christ and help the gospel be spread throughout the world. And it's... It's multi-million dollar, it's a big deal. Well, Keith went to school to be a pastor. Uh, I went to school to be a missionary. He went to school to be a pastor. I ended up being a pastor. Through various things, he ends up working for this fund. So this was his job. His job was to travel the world and find places to give away money. But that's, that's quite a job. And so he had a lot of really cool stories. He met very 
famous people and, and throughout the world. He met presidents and all these very famous people. But he, had a really, he told me this really cool story this week. And I can't give you names and I can't give you con- or places because you'll understand as I tell the story. There was one particular friend that he had contacted, been, been in contact with, and the friend said, listen, I want you to meet me at such and such hotel. I want you to go to such and such hotel. And, and when you get there, um, you will see me at a distance. But then after you see me at a distance, I will text you a room number. And when you see that room number, trust me and come to that room. It was all James Bond-like. It was all spy-like. Like, oh, what's going on? But he trusted this guy. And so sure enough, he goes to the hotel, and the guy sees him and, and then disappears. Sometime later, he gets a text. He goes, he follows his instructions. He goes to that room. He walks into the room, and there's the guy he knows, and there's a guy he's never met before. And the guy he's never met before begins to tell his story. He said, I am uh, from, they were in the country that they were they're talking about. He says, I am a jihadist, and I have my own school where I have been for years teaching jihadists how to build bombs and how to kill people. He was, he was not only teaching them how to do it, but he was teaching everything behind it, the hate behind it, all that went into it. And at this uh, moment, Keith's like, okay, why am I here? And he said, well, something amazing happened. He said, miraculously, I have come to know Jesus Christ. Now, around the world, uh, or in our world, there are a number of people who who claim to be uh, miracle workers of some type. For the most part, it's fake. If you follow that up, the TV preachers and whatnot, if you follow that up, and many people have, it's fake. It's, It's not real. But in places of the world where it is so dark, where it's very difficult for the the gospel to go, miracles do still happen. And that's what happened with this guy. And without anybody ever telling him, he came to know Christ, found a Bible, and became a believer. He said, now, I want to work from the inside. And so what he did is he, he changed his school to become a school that taught more about love, but it was still Islam. And as the students would come, he would talk about these different things and he would notice ones who would be open to change and he would invite them to a second school, a hidden school. And in this school, he would teach them the gospel that they might come to Christ. You see, the power of the Spirit is at work all over the world. The kingdom of God Jesus is at work all over the world in amazing ways. And he's at work right here. For some of you, maybe one or two, I don't know, maybe there's more. You know the voice of God because he's been talking to you. You don't believe, you've never believed, you've never trusted, you've never said yes. But he's been talking to you. He's been saying, I do love you, I do want to forgive you, and you've been going. If you want the power of the Spirit, say yes. Say yes. But for others, there's an area of your life you've been saying no. You've either been interacting with Jesus that you want that power for your kingdom and your way, your comfort, for you to be seen and heard. Or something happened along the way and Jesus has said, I I want you to surrender that to me. And you've said, half. You've said later. You've said, just as soon as. I want to invite you today to surrender it all. This Jesus you followed, he had all the power in the universe. And he decided it was best to trust the Father. I invite you today 
to stop trusting yourself and surrender to Jesus and the power of the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we sing this song, I ask you to make it crystal clear, the area of the person's life, each person's life, that they might surrender to you. As, as they sing, as we sing, Lord, just, just press. Press hard on their heart so they might trust you, humble themselves, obey you in all that they do. In your name we pray, amen.